I don't praise you. 
singing, standing for our scripture reading. Why I love singing these words that we sing, you know, for a thousand tongues to sing. And God singing about his being the faithful one. Um, just wonderful songs. Thank you, Heath. Our scripture reading comes from Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Amen. We get to resume our study in the Gospel of John this morning. We're in chapter 10. We're going to begin chapter 10, so if you want to flip over there, we'll all get to the same spot. And as we begin, um, we're going to see a wonderful chapter in chapter 10 where Jesus is going to be teaching a parable, and in it he draws a contrast between himself, the good shepherd, and uh, between, between that and the spiritual leaders, or the self-proclaimed spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, in Israel in his day, who he describes as thieves and robbers. And so, um, with that imagery, we, we think about ourselves in light of the Lord, and in light of the relationship that we have with him, and he is our shepherd. And one of the things that I love reading about in scripture is those that were actual shepherds. And we'll mention that a little bit later this morning. Um, but they were out day after day with the sheep in the field, and facing all kinds of weather and hardships. And in it, they had a unique opportunity to grow close to the Lord. And you see that especially in David, a, a man who spent a lot of time outdoors, and he cultivated a close relationship with God. And he understood that relationship of him as the shepherd with the sheep that he was caring for to his relationship with God as his shepherd. And you, you see him bring that out in Psalm 23 in particular. But one of the things I love about David is he was a man called a man after God's own heart. And when it comes to our relationship with God, um, our salvation is secure. Once we trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, it's a done deal. Our salvation is secure in him because of what he did on the cross for us. We don't work out our salvation. We don't do enough to try to gain or, or keep our salvation in some way. Um, but the thing that gets damaged is our walk with the Lord, our close fellowship with him. And so we see that example from David in a number of Psalms of just a man of humility. As we see in Psalm uh, 32 is a good example. You have David in, in recognizing his own sinfulness and, ex and stating that before the Lord. He said, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. He goes on to talk about his own experience. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. And then he says in verse 5, I, but then a change came. Because I acknowledged my sin, and that, that groaning within my bones lifted and my iniquity I didn't hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. It says, you forgave me the guilt of my sin. And, and so he recognizes that God is the God of forgiveness and restoration. And our role is to do what David did, and just to come clean in humility and confess those to the Lord, and he will forgive and restore immediately. He's a gracious God, and um, we have that close fellowship with God restored through that mechanism. So let's take a moment of... Uh, silent prayer as we open, and you can take care of anything that you need to take care of between you and the Lord before we come to study his word, and then we'll open in uh, prayer together. Let's pray.
Father, thank you that we can know you, that you are the personal God, and you have always been the personal God. The God who acted directly uh, in your world, in, in the, into your creation. We see you intervening right at the beginning. A world that was formless and void, and you molded and shaped and made it into what was the perfect environment for us to live in. And then, Lord, you filled it. You created the, the stars and the seas and the plants and the animals and ultimately human beings. And, Lord, into that, you have always had a close relationship as it began with Adam walking with God in the garden with you. And that close relationship was shared. And, and then sin came and it was fractured very badly. But you provided a way of restoration. Your plan of salvation began in Genesis 3. And Lord, it continues on. And you desire that close fellowship with each one of us. As we're going to see in our passage this morning, Lord, we ask that you would, that you would show us this passage maybe in a new light. That it's probably one that we've read a million times before, but maybe haven't really stopped to consider the details of it. Lord, thank you for the example of your son who came personally, who lived among people, who was gracious and patient and taught. And you have given us your word and you've given us his example. And Lord, we ask that you would bless this time we have in this passage here in the book of John. That you would... Help us to um, set aside the things that distract us. But in our love for you, we would have a love and a hunger for your word. And that you would bless this time, that you would illuminate this passage through your Holy Spirit. For us, Lord, we ask that you would teach us. That we would come expectantly. That we would come hungry anytime we get to open up your word. Lord, we ask that you would bless this passage this morning. And that you would teach us richly from your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, as we think about the Bible, um, it has, for many years, fascinated many people just in terms of as a body of literature. And, you know, if you think about the different forms of literature that it includes, it includes poetry, it includes narrative, it includes, um, as we're going to see this morning, this first part of John is actually a parable. It's the only parable in the Gospel of John. But it is complex in its rich literary devices that it features throughout. It is a magnificent literary work, and it's one given to us by God, but it also is not just literature, it is spiritual. It's eternal truth. So we get to enjoy the richness of this wonderful book in terms of its literary value, but we also get to be blessed immeasurably by it in terms of God communicating his truth to us through it. It is rich and it is powerful and it has lasted for all time and it will last forever. So one of the devices um, that it begins with in John chapter 10 is this parable. Let's begin by reading through our passage. We're in John 10, and as you can see, there's these seven I am statements in John. We've already covered uh, Jesus discussing himself as the bread of life in John 6, and as the light of the world in John 8 and 9. And then now in chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the, the gate or the door. I am the door. I prefer to call it the sheep gate. I think there's some significance to that uh, rendering. So let's look at our passage, John 10, 1 through 10, most assuredly, or truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. 
Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. These are the Pharisees that don't understand. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So, before we continue, um, just a word about this section of scripture being a parable. Um, one of the kinds of literature that I absolutely love is an allegory. Do you guys love a good allegory? Um, you know, when there's characters, there's elements to the story that are made to represent something else. So an allegory, by definition, is a work that makes extensive use of symbolism in order to communicate broader moral or meaning. And into this definition, nearly every aspect of an allegory, from characters to objects to dialogue to settings to major plot events, can typically be interpreted as having a secondary symbolic meaning. So an allegory is a type of story that represents an idea or a concept or a historical event, it could be an ideology, that's different from the literal events contained within the story. I've probably said it before, but one of my favorite books is Animal Farm. Um, it was written uh, some time ago, decades ago, and it allegorizes through the use of farm animals the dangers of the Marxist um, system, ideology, um, at a time when, when the, you know, the threat of communism was running high and, and that was put out there as a wonderful literary work. Now, a parable is kind of similar to an allegory. The difference, really, is that a, a parable, we could say, is a temporal everyday story designed to communicate God's eternal truth. So a, an allegory is, basically we put the difference this way, that both use the element of symbolism, they're symbolizing something, but an allegory uses human situations or ideas, animals, concepts to communicate basically human truth, if we're going to put it in practical terms. A parable, on the other hand, uses human situations to communicate spiritual truth. So in an allegory, it becomes important to identify every single element because everything in that allegory has something that is important to identify to understand it. A parable, though, it's not necessary to identify every single element because there are some that are not necessarily related to the main point. They're just designed to make the parable realistic and relatable and are included simply to enable the audience to fully enter into the story. And so we're going to see that in this parable as is so often. Um, even in the other parables, for instance, Matthew chapter 13, you'll see elements of um, that that discourse of Jesus where there's different um, parables in view, the kingdom parables of Matthew 13, where Jesus is clear in identifying certain main components, but others he, he uh, doesn't address directly. And so, you know, a lot of people have gotten hung up on those thinking, okay, well, I've got to make sure I figure out every single detail um, when that may very well not be the case in the the type of literature that this is as a parable. So let's review just a little bit of how we got here in Matthew, or I'm saying Matthew, John chapter 9. So this was a couple weeks ago. Last week was Memorial Day, but two, uh, actually, Pastor Paul, you spoke two weeks ago. So this was three weeks ago. So we want to set our bearings, get back into context, because it's been a little while. Um, in John chapter 9, it began with a discussion about sin. You know, what about this blind man? They come across this man, he's a, a beggar, and they, they say, you know, who sinned? The disciples ask Jesus, him or his parents? And then the chapter ends, at the end of chapter 9, with a discussion about sin. It goes from a discussion throughout this chapter, though, of going from the sinfulness of this man born blind to a discussion about the sinfulness of well, Jesus gets included in there, but ultimately the Pharisees. And so we see this transition throughout chapter 9. And 
Um, we saw in verse 25 that this man who is now formerly blind, Jesus healed him, comes face to face with the Pharisees. And he is astute. And he understands that they hate Jesus. So he understands that they're trying to interrogate him so as to use him in order to gain ammunition against Jesus. So he does the very smartest thing he can do, and he just sticks to the facts. He just sticks to the facts of, of his own experience. He says, this is all I know. I was blind, but now I see. He said, there isn't anyone else running around healing people blind since birth. So he sticks to his own experience. And there's a lesson in there for us. That sometimes people think, I've got to come up with you know, the greatest evangelistic method I can. You know, I've got to get all my ducks in a row. I've got to really get out there with a passion. But many times the reality is, what's your story? How did God work in your life? And you can just share that with other people. And that is a powerful, powerful testimony to have. And we also saw that the Pharisees had this obsession with, as was their habit, of um, not being willing to just kind of let it go and to move on. And so they keep grilling this formerly blind man, grilling him, grilling him, and ultimately his patience runs out. And you can see this by how he replies in a sarcastic way. This kind of makes me laugh. Um, they, they keep on insisting about hearing the same story. of tell, tell us, Give us the details. How did this happen? How, how did you regain your sight? Uh, we want to know. And he's like, well, I've already told you. Why do you keep insisting? He says, do you want to become Jesus' disciples too? And boy, there's a lot of uh, humor in there in, in his sarcastic response, and it really gets them upset. And so the Pharisees have to admit, you know, they're always the, the know-it-alls. They, they know everything. They, there's nothing that they ever admit to not knowing, but then here they are admitting that they don't know about Jesus. They don't, they don't know where he is from, they readily admit. So the formerly blind man picks up on this huge dose of irony and what the Pharisees have just admitted to. He picks up on it, and he replies with more sarcasm. So I can just imagine him kind of laughing as he says these words. Um, he's like, oh, really? There, there's something that you don't know. Um, you know, here we have a man going around opening the eyes of blind men, and uh, you know, how can you not know anything about this guy? We... See in the example of the Pharisees that they are very harsh. They are going to lash out at this formerly blind man. They're going to seek to punish him. And so we noted last time the difference between human responses and many times what we wish to see happen and how God operates and how he actually deals with things. We as human beings have a tendency to be vindictive or to want vindication, but God is just. So people can be vicious like these Pharisees, but God is gracious. The Pharisees were offended by the truth of this man, and so they responded as harshly as they could, and so they exercised all their authority, and they permanently expelled him from the synagogue. And this is basically lights out for a person in society. The synagogue was the hub of town. It was the central gathering spot for town meetings. Um, in addition to worship services every Saturday, they would read scripture, they would pray, they would study the word. And it was just central to the life in, of people in every way. It's where connections were made, friendships were made, business connections were kept up. It was, it was important to your life to be part of the synagogue, and if that gets all of a sudden sliced in half, it is very, um, very damaging to an individual. And so his parents, we see them as very afraid, walking on eggshells around, their, around these Pharisees. They didn't want to get expelled from the synagogue. But this man, he just doesn't care. He's just beyond that. And he only cares about what Jesus did in his life. He's going to testify to that. And whatever it costs him, it costs him. And so the Pharisees kick him out of the synagogue. And then we see Jesus. And Jesus came and he found him. And Jesus ministered to him. He met him. He came directly to him. 
One of the things that we see about Jesus is how he works in this man's life. He first meets him, and he stops, and he addresses this man and his situation, and he engages him. And now, on the other side of this event, as, Je as this blind man, formerly blind man, has gotten kicked out of the synagogue, Jesus finds him and he meets him. And he's about to impart truth to him. He's about to ask him this question if he believes in the Son of Man. And he says, yes, you know, tell me who he is. And he's like, the one who you're speaking with, who you see, you know, is him, is the, the Son of Man, the, the one you're talking about, the Messiah. And so a little bit of insight that gives us into how God works in our lives and in everyone's mm -hmm. lives. That when we understand truth about God, we begin to respond to that truth, to walk in it, to worship God, we want to know Him more, God will then be faithful to reveal more, more truth to you, more about Himself to you. He will, we are faithful in the, the first things that we know as part of discipleship, growing as a disciple. Is, you know, I maybe have memorized two verses. Okay, you know, the Lord's going to take those two verses and He's going to run with them. He's going to help you to apply them and he's going to use them if you want to share those with others. And then he's going to teach you more. And it's an ongoing process of growth, how the Lord works. And ultimately, the end goal is to press on to maturity in Christ and to not remain as a spiritual baby. So that brings us up to chapter 9. So it left off, and let's just mention where it left off. Chapter 9, um, the words specifically were addressed by Jesus to the Pharisees. Those Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and they asked Jesus, We are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. And this is followed in chapter 10 by um, this, this these words, Truly, truly, I say to you, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, um, but climbs up some other way, is the same as a thief and a robber. So these words are being addressed to a plural group who are the Pharisees. That helps us to set our context. What about our physical context? Um, we are dealing with an analogy here in verse 1. We see it right off the bat of a, a sheepfold. A sheep pen is basically what this is having a door. So Jesus jumps into addressing the Pharisees from the standpoint of something common to everyday life in all of their day in this parable, and that is sheep. And here is um, an example of a ancient Near East sheep pen. It would have a, a stone wall around it, and it would have a, a doorway. It would have a gate where the sheep could come in um, they could be safe within its walls, and they could come back out. So that kind of gives us a visual. But specific to our context, we find that this takes place in Jerusalem. So you think, well, maybe this analogy wouldn't resonate, because they're not off in the countryside in some field where there's a, a sheep pasture. But here in Jerusalem, in Jesus' day, just to the north of the temple... One of the gates in the outer wall of Jerusalem was called the Sheep Gate. And it was where they would bring in the sheep from uh, into the city, and they could store them in these large pens, these folds, or they could take them outside of the city. And why was this going on? Why, why were sheep such an important aspect of daily life in this big city of Jerusalem? Well, it was because of animal sacrifices, because that was their worship system that was prescribed from the early days of I mean, you can even go back to the patriarchs. All the way till Jesus' day in Jerusalem, that's what God had prescribed as the proper way for people to worship him was through the shedding of blood. It was through an animal sacrifice. Now we know we live on the other side of the cross, don't we? For the cross like this. We live on the other side. So we know that that Old Testament animal sacrifices, that sacrificial system, would one day be replaced not too long after Jesus was talking here to these Pharisees with a once-for-all atonement when Jesus would go to the cross. However, at this time, when Jesus is talking to these Pharisees, 
animal sacrifices were still in practice. Um, and that would happen actually until 70 AD when Rome came in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and then all sacrifices ceased. So there was actually a time in there after Jesus' death when animal sacrifices were no longer prescribed, but people, uh, the, the Jewish people, were still practicing them until they couldn't any longer. But in Jesus' day, Jerusalem had many large sheep pens there in Jerusalem. And so during the day, this would be an ordinary part of everybody's experience. They would see sheep. They would smell sheep. They'd be coming. They'd be going. They'd be hearing the loud noise of these sheep. And they'd be going outside the city a lot of times during the day, coming in in the evening. They'd go out to graze. They'd come in for safekeeping. Or um, probably during the major holidays where a lot of sacrifices were required, these pens would all be very full all the time because they needed the sheep to um, meet the needs of those coming to Jerusalem to worship. But they would be typically brought in through the sheep gate. This one gate in Jerusalem was, was the normal, ordinary way that the sheep would be brought into the city to be kept safe overnight in one of these many large sheep pens or sheep folds. So I think this forms the imagery for Jesus' parable. It was, even to city dwellers, this was a common scenario that they could all relate to. So in verse 1, let's back up here, Jesus said, Truly, truly, this is the 15th time so far in the Gospel of John that we've seen this phrase, truly, truly. And whenever Jesus uses this phrase, truly, truly, or most assuredly, I say to you, he's saying that this is absolutely true. You can take it to the bank. And it also means to take heed, to pay attention. He says, um, in, in essence, pay close attention to what I'm about to say, because I'm about to tell you something really important that you need to know. He says, um, I say to you all, um, and in our modern English that gets obscured because you functions as both a singular and a plural, but this one is a plural. So he says, I say to you guys, to you all, and he's talking to these Pharisees. He hasn't deviated in his um, people who he's addressing. And as we just saw, the very last thing he just said to them was that he said, I say to you all that because they claim to see, their sin remains. Again, as we said last time, in essence, if you were blind, you would not be arrogant and self-righteous and hostile. But since you esteem yourselves so highly, you remain stuck in your sin. And he's going to transition right from that into this. He's going to basically call them out as false shepherds. Now, they've just demonstrated that they're false shepherds by their disregard for the sheep. They took one of those sheep and they permanently expelled the formerly blind man from the synagogue. I'm using sheep figuratively to describe a man. These false shepherds, these spiritual leaders in Israel, couldn't care less about the formerly blind man. They abused him by treating him harshly, manipulatively, vindictively, as they threw him out of the synagogue. But Jesus, the kind shepherd, found him and ministered to him. So now, here's Jesus. He's about to call out these false shepherds, and he's about to use a parable to do it. Um, you know, I think this is a very common thing in our day, where people slam other people. Um, you know, we call it uh, throwing shade on someone. That's what Jesus is about to do to these Pharisees. He's going to use this creative way to do it through a parable, and they're going to become, be kind of clueless. Um, he's basically going to slam them, and they're not going to get it. Um, sometimes that happens to people in our day on Twitter and some of these formats. But basically, Jesus is identifying the shepherd as one who comes to the fold through the normal way, through the gate. That's the way. The shepherd comes in and the shepherd comes out. Everybody knows that. But then he contrasts that with someone else who has to climb up over a wall because he's either a thief or a robber. And maybe your mind is like mine where you instantly think, well... What's the difference between a thief and a robber? Are those kind of the same thing? The difference is a thief tries to do it very sneak, in a sneaky way. In order to try to not be seen, in order to try to not get caught, it's, 
It's a stealthy operation. Whereas a robber, um, this is the idea of this Greek word, is a thug, someone we could call it a thug or a gangster, someone who steals openly and brashly, but, and, and they do it by force or by threat of force. They just, you know, like a hold up, like a robbery at a bank or something. Um, that's the idea. So he says that those who have to climb up over a wall are either sneaking and trying to steal, or they're just brazenly, you know, sword in one hand, don't care who gets in their way, they're just going to grab and grab and go. And so that's our imagery here in verses 1 and 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So he's immediately drawing this contrast. Um, let's move on to verse Three. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, um, this, I believe, is one of those details where we have the, the doorkeeper doesn't really factor in in a significant way to the meaning of this parable. Some have labored hard to try to identify this doorkeeper. Um, some have suggested that the doorkeeper would be maybe God the Father, or the doorkeeper would be God the Holy Spirit, or the doorkeeper would be John the Baptist. Um, and I think that all of those are, are certainly good, strong possibilities. Um, John definitely used the sheep imagery, behold the Lamb of God. Um, and so any of those are possible, but I don't think that it's imperative that we <coughs> identify who the doorkeeper is. It seems that the, the purpose of this doorkeeper, or um, in Spanish there you see el portero, um, not a goalie, <laughs> for his soccer fans. Um, but uh, the, we have a word in English, actually an old word, it's a porter. A porter was a, a, a doorman, someone who let people in and out through, through the door. We don't really use it much anymore. But the, we have this individual mentioned in the parable who doesn't seem imperative to understanding the parable. Um, but we have the purpose of the parable right here in verse 3. The purpose is stated as to gather the flock of sheep. You see the, the doorkeeper open, the shepherd comes in, and he calls his sheep by name. He's there to gather his flock. So one of the aspects of this scene is that Jesus had not come to work within the system. The system was the one of the day that was run by the Pharisees. They thought they had a lock on religion and on piousness. Um, in, uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, Jesus said, I came to divide. And so what he was dealing with was a, a system, a religious system that was empty and it was dead. And now he's not going to work within it. He's coming to call people out of it. He's going to work from without the, um, their, outside of their system. So how could the shepherd, though, gather his flock when they need life? Well, as we're going to find out, the only way that he could do that was to separate them from their old system, and then he's going to go on to say in a few verses down that he is going to lay down his life for the sheep of those who are his own. Um, verses 4 and 5. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. So verse 3 says he leads them out, that's one Greek word, exage, to bring out. And then in verse 4, uh, we have another word, I'll, I'll just highlight those. So we have right here, leads them out, exage, and then... Verse 4, um, it says, he brings out, it's, it's actually, um, ekbalo is the word, it, it's to expel. Um, so he's, he's says, there, there are different connotations. One is he's come to basically get them out, and then verse 4 says he comes to extract them, to push them out, to move them out. And you know maybe there's a, a stubborn one that's hanging back or two, and he's got to you know use that uh, straight edge of his crook to move them along. They're being stubborn; they want to waste time, and they don't want to leave the the 
pen like the rest of the sheep. Um, but uh, Jesus uses this language to describe the fact that he knows his sheep. And that means all of us who are his. We are his sheep, you and me. Do you ever think about it in those terms? How amazing it is to be known by Jesus Christ. You know, I was kind of just thinking about this in, in um, our terms and thinking through verse 5, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him. They do not know the voice of strangers. And um, so it, it, uh, it goes on here in, in verse 5. Um, it says, you know, he, he basically calls them, he knows them, and verse 3 it is. It says, he, he calls them by name. Jesus calls you by name. Now, in sheep's terms, I was thinking about this, and, you know, I don't know what a shepherd would typically name their sheep. Maybe they, you know, this is uh, Freddie, and this is... Um, Julie, or I don't know what you name sheep. Uh, maybe they're more named according to their characteristics. This is, you know, mellow the sheep over here, and this is happy sheep over here, and this is oblivious sheep over here, and sleepy sheep over here, and maybe this is bully, and this is stubborn sheep, or this one's grumpy sheep. Um, in our terms, our shepherd knows your quirks. He knows your disposition. He knows your interests. He knows your skills. He knows you. I, I was thinking about this idea of animals um, being known by names. All of our pets have names, uh, as you would expect for domestic animals, cats and dogs. Um, but uh, one time, Harry and Patty Knowlton, this was a few years ago, had me and our kids come over, um, and I, I was kind of shocked. I never expected in my entire life to walk into a house and find a calf. Um, but they had a calf, and it hadn't quite gotten its stability yet on its legs, and so it was just kind of chilling on the floor, and we got to go up and pet the a new calf, and uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, I got some pictures, so I should pull it out one of these days. Um, but they also had a cow in their yard, and uh, its name was Stakes. Didn't really have a, have a right future for a <laughs> No joke, because they mistakes. <laughs> so, you know, even, even um, barnyard animals get uh, names that can be quite telling. And so, it, as this passage progresses, it says that he, he brings them out of the sheepfold. And in fact, he has to maybe forcibly even expel a few of them that are being stubborn. But once out of the sheepfold, it says here in verse 6, um, it says, hmm, I don't think I got the right words. Let's try verse actual 6. Um, yeah, that's the right words. Um, it says, a stranger they do not follow, but will flee from him because they do not... No, the voice of strangers. I guess it's verse 4. Look at verse 4. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And so he walks ahead of them, and they follow him. A false shepherd can never lead the sheep because they'll never listen to him. They're, they're not going to follow someone they don't know his voice, and they're going to flee from him. Um, and this, this leads us to the, the reason why... Um, a false shepherd can never lead the sheep, and so all he can do is steal the sheep. <laughs> so a person, and I'm using this uh, very generally, to describe people in everyday life who are just those kind of hard-hearted, arrogant, or disinterested people, you're going to find they cannot be reached, and we're seeing this more and more in our day, by logic, or by common sense, and especially by spiritual truth. <laughs> And so Jesus, it's notable here as he's speaking to these Pharisees. Look at verse 6. It says, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, I find this almost hard to believe because what he was speaking to them was so simple. 
he was using really, really simple language, and he spoke in very familiar imagery and terminology. These were things that were part of their everyday experience that they could understand really easily. And in addition to that, all throughout the Old Testament, God used the imagery, like in our scripture reading this morning, of Israel as his flock. How do we identify this flock? Um, people have identified this flock different ways. You know, this is, this is the church, or this is... Um, you know, God's kingdom, or different things. No, it's very clear. Just read the Old Testament. The flock is Israel. All throughout the Old Testament, God described Israel as his flock, his chosen people. And he's constantly getting on these wicked shepherds. He was angry with them throughout the Old Testament. Those who were in a position of spiritual leadership to lead the people with whom he was angry because they were wicked. And then you can contrast that with the faithful shepherds in the Old Testament with whom God was very well pleased. Men like Moses and David and Amos and Zechariah. These are examples of godly, faithful shepherds. In fact, speaking of Moses, he literally was a shepherd, as we talked about in our Bible study. Um, he was out among the sheep. He was, maybe at times, felt like he didn't know where his life was going. He was 40 years out there just as a shepherd, just going to work every day. But then, at the end of Moses' life, I want to put a passage up here. Numbers chapter 27. Moses is about to die. And so, naturally, when there's a transition that has to take place, there's got to be a new leader that's going to lead the congregation of Israel in Moses' place. And so he's asking God to raise up his replacement as the next leader of the people because he's about to die. He's concerned about the transition of leadership. So he prays. And he spoke to the Lord saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a new man, essentially, over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like Sheep which have no shepherd. So Moses takes this shepherd imagery that he learned so well as a shepherd in the field, and he applies it to the leadership spiritually of the nation of Israel. So this concept of you know going in, coming out, being well taken care of, well led by a shepherd, Moses uses readily. So Jesus' parable is not in obscure language for the people. It's in common, everyday language that they should have understood. And Jesus has been, up till now, in verse 6, presenting himself as the one true shepherd, and at the same time condemning the Pharisees as thieves and robbers, as wicked shepherds, false shepherds. So now, in verses 7 and 8, so they don't understand, they're clueless, Jesus is going to take this already very basic analogy and he's going to lower it all the way to the ground. He's going to boil it down to the bottom line. And so we're going to see him use these words again. Um, truly, truly. Jesus said to them again, truly, truly. He says, listen up. This is important. What I'm about to say to you is true and you need to hear it. And I can just imagine Jesus there... These Pharisees are not getting it. It should be completely obvious, but because of the hardness of their hearts and their own arrogance, they just don't get it. They, they act like, um, you know, Jesus maybe has the problem. You know, he's, he's telling them something that's confusing. Um, they, we can't even understand what you're talking about. So he's like, okay. I can just imagine at this point Jesus talking very slowly. <laughs> Like he's talking to idiots. <laughs> and so he addresses them in this way. He says, verse 8, he's, he says, All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So um, he, says, um, he says, he starts by saying this, I am the door of the sheep. Even if he's pointing across town in Jerusalem to that sheep gate, he's like, okay, I am the sheep gate. Let's break this down really slowly for you because you're, you're idiots. See that gate over there in the wall of Jerusalem? Okay, that's me. And everyone who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. 
So he's like, specifically, I'm the door, meaning that any, anyone enters through me, he will be saved, both from you guys, the thieves and robbers, the, the predatory, abusive spiritual leaders, the Pharisees, but also at the same time saved eternally. And you will go in and out. You'll be able to go freely in and out of the gates. That means to be at peace. To not be scared as you're going in or coming or coming in or going out. And also to go out and to find pasture. Um, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out without care and find pasture. That's the place where the food is. That's where the feeding takes place. So Jesus uses the present tense when he says are. Um, here he says, all those who came before me are, not were, thieves and robbers. So that tells us that he's talking about these present religious leaders, not just wicked shepherds back in the past, like in Zechariah chapter 10 or, or in Jeremiah or other places. He's talking about this group of spiritual leaders who are thieves and robbers. And there is only one gate. There's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ, and he is the sheep gate. So he breaks this down into very plain and simple and clear imagery that everybody can understand. Um, I like over in Matthew when Jesus um, talks about going the, through the, the narrow road, not the wide road, but the narrow road. And so Jesus said, it's me. I'm the way. I'm the door. Um, you know, it's interesting because Jesus didn't claim to know the, know the way, to, to show the way. And, you know, in the nature of religious systems, if you look across the world's religions, is that they, they claim to have access to some higher knowledge, to some prophet, to some guru, to someone who can show others the way of enlightenment. Okay, here, you know, here, here it is. Let, let, let me break it down for you. Um, you know, keep all these rituals, whatever it is. But Jesus says, in contrast to all that, it's me. I'm the way. I'm the door. So in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. Now, we have salvation spoken of through Jesus as the door. He will be saved. You also have peace and contentment spoken in, being able to go in and out easily without concern, and then you have pasture. The shepherd leads his sheep to where they can be well fed. When you're properly nourished, you grow strong. We all know this. You want your kids to eat healthy foods, maybe you know um, a balanced meal or organic foods. You shop at Trader Joe's or Costco. You want the best because you want proper nutrition so that those, especially who are young, who are still growing, can grow up strong and healthy. We call this process sanctification. It's the process of spiritual growth. And we can trust the good shepherd to lead us to good food. Your job and my job is to make the most of it, to eat and digest, meaning to learn God's word and apply it. And that's where there's a lot of times a breakdown with Christians. God can lead to the good food, but if they're not willing to eat it, that's extremely sad. And it happens all the time. So let's look at our first takeaway here, spiritual nourishment. Pasturing means eating. In order to be properly nourished, we must eat spiritual food in order to grow spiritually. The malnourished Christian life is one that tries to be sustained by all kinds of things, our emotions, our experiences, our intentions, or our traditions. But we can only be well-nourished by the Word of God. Let that sink in. Remember that. We can only be well-nourished by the Word of God. Let us be well-fed sheep. I love this quote by Dr. Mitchell, the former president of my alma mater, Multnomah, now it's Multnomah University, it was Multnomah School of the Bible. Let us be well-fed sheep, he writes. Search the scriptures. In them you will find life and strength and peace. So spiritual nourishment is what we all need. God's word is where we're going to find the food that we need for our growth. Um, let's look at verse. Uh, where's ten? There's ten. Verse ten. The thief comes not to. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Um, I like this quote a lot by Warren Wiersbe. Uh, he says, The true shepherd came to save the sheep, but the false shepherds take advantage of the sheep and exploit them. 
behind these false shepherds is the thief, probably a reference to Satan, I agree with him on that. The thief wants to steal the sheep from the fold, slaughter them, and destroy them. So you see a stark, stark contrast. One who has come that they may have life and have it abundantly. We see this in Psalm 23, which expresses the life of a sheep in the care of a good shepherd as the former shepherd, David, relates his life to God and is living what we're going to call the contented life. The contented life of a sheep. It says that the sheep lay, lay down. And apparently it's really hard for sheep to lay down. They have to be in an environment where they're not afraid, where there's not tension, where there's not fights with other sheep, aggravating factors, um, you know, a bunch of uh, insects that are driving them crazy and stinging them and everything. Um, they're not hungry. Only once all those perfect conditions can be met will sheep lay down. In Psalm 23, the imagery David uses is of lying down. It's of a, a, a happy, content sheep. One who is well guided by a capable shepherd. Because sheep, we know, are quick to wander. That is the nature of the animals, and we see parallels in ourselves. Safe because predators abound, and sheep are extremely vulnerable to predators. They don't have the horns, they don't have you know, the claws, they don't have the things that you would want to defend yourself. Armor, like an armadillo, they are very defenseless. They need a shepherd to take care of them, to keep them safe from the predators that they're vulnerable to. We also know that sheep need to be cared for. They need to be sheared. Um, you probably saw those pictures a few years ago of that sheep down in, I think it was Australia, where it wandered and it got off on its own and it, its fleece just kept growing and growing and growing. And it was about to starve to death because it, it, it couldn't get access to the food over its wool. So it needs to be sheared, anointed with oil to protect it from parasites, to have plenty of food and water. And all that imagery comes right from Psalm 23, one of the wonderful psalms of Scripture. We, um, we can say that all this amounts to abundant life. There's different ways that, you know, God is the God of life. He gives life. He gives eternal life. He gives new life. He gives resurrection life. He gives abundant life. So what does abundant life look like? Um, I've got a quote that I really like from um, Charlie Bink. Eternal life is God's life given as a permanent possession, but it is also God's life given as something to enjoy. And this is huge this morning. It is both a quality of life as well as a quantity, as well as a quantity of life as well as a quality of life. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly in verse 10. Besides an initial possession that brings a relationship to God, eternal life is also an abundant life of knowing God, which indicates fellowship or enjoyment of that life. The condition for continual enjoyment of God's life is also faith. There's a, a huge faith component there as well. So I want to zero in on this abundant life concept as we conclude this morning with the idea of contentment. Contentment is a non-stop opportunity for believers in Jesus Christ. And it's one that I think so often we forfeit. The joy of close fellowship with the shepherd is manifested in experiencing joy through the enjoyment of our personal relationship with him. With Christ. It is a reward for walking with Him in faithful obedience. The Christian life is purposeful, rewarding, satisfying, and yields contentment. The constant opportunity before us is to experience this life in abundance as Jesus gives and intends for us. But I'm going to tell you that there's a lot that gets in the way of that. And I, I can tell you from my own experience, it's a struggle. And I think it is for all of us. We, we worry. We become afraid. We get busy. We, uh, you know, it can be all kinds of things that cause us to not find that contentment, um, to be able to find that rest, to be able to find, to really enjoy that abundant life of a close walk with our shepherd. So we want to take that 
And we want to be aware of that. That, that is a, a, a really powerful component of the Christian life, is that we should be joyful, um, not a, a phony joy, but one that comes from the joy of a relationship with the Lord. One that comes from an ongoing close fellowship with Him, of walking in obedience to Him, of serving Him, of serving others, of just doing what He wants us to be doing, of growing close to Him through our time of prayer and of learning about Him through His Word. That constant Christian life, as we live it out, as we seek to grow, as we seek to grow spiritually, to feed on the nourishment that He provides us, is a very purposeful, rewarding, satisfying, contented life. That's the life of, if you view us as sheep, from God's perspective, it's helpful to think of ourselves from that perspective. We want to be those, those happy sheep, not those grumpy sheep. We want to be the, the joyful, contented sheep, not the angry, stubborn, you know, um, angry sheep or whatever. So with that, I hope that we'll be able to take that and to seek to apply that. Um, we'll continue on with this parable starting in verse 11 next time where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So another I am statement in John, and Jesus is going to continue this imagery, this parable, by drawing a contrast. We'll look at that next time. If you're here this morning and you don't know the shepherd, who is the good shepherd? Why do we many times not know him? And I think a lot of times it's ignorance. Other times it's um, an unwillingness or a lack of desire to, to know him, to know spiritual things. And that's all rooted in the problem of sin. We're fallen. We're people who have a fallen sinful nature that we inherited automatically as descendants of Adam and Eve. We are people who automatically, by default, go our own way, do our own thing pursue our own um, goals and ambitions and pursuits and can leave the things of the Lord as an afterthought. We become many times like that sheep with the overgrown fleece. We become in dire straits. We get all turned around and in falling into pits and in problems because of sin. And not only that, sin has a consequence, an eternal punishment attached to it. And that is eternal death. The, the idea that um, hell is a real literal place and that we're all destined to go there. And that's very disheartening. But God is the good shepherd. And it says that he's not willing that any should perish. And so he took that sin problem that from one man was passed to all humanity and he said, I'm going to solve it by applying a solution to all of humanity and it's going to come also by one man. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, perfect, sinless, became a man, God and man, the God-man at the same time. He came to this earth, and he's the good shepherd that we're talking about this morning. And he laid down his life for the sheep. He voluntarily went to the cross to lay down his life to take care of that sin problem and to rescue each of us, you and me. He came and he died on the cross. And on that cross, he paid the penalty for sin. He forgave all sins, all of your sins, past, present, future sins, and he gave you the gift of a new life, eternal life, and abundant life. And it's through his death and resurrection. You know, he went to the cross like this, and we say he died and was buried, and then he rose again. And so we have a wonderful picture of salvation, and that's offered as a gift. It's extended to each person here, or who's listening online maybe, that you can receive that gift, you can know the Good Shepherd, you can have new life, eternal life, abundant life, through accepting that gift of Jesus Christ, laying down his life for you, making the way of salvation the only way, I am the door, come to me, come through this one way, receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you will have eternal life, permanently. It is a gift you can never lose. But it comes by faith. You have to exercise faith and say, yes, I, I believe that Jesus died for me. I'm trusting in him personally as my Savior. We have, if you haven't made that decision, I pray that you will leave here. You will not leave here without making that decision to trust in Jesus Christ. We have a couple of um, 
young women this morning who have made that decision, they've trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they want to show us about that through the picture of baptism. What is baptism? Well, in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, I should say, chapter 1, verse 3, we read that His divine power has been given, has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Baptism is a significant milestone because it's a step, it's an important step of obedience. It's one of those very first steps that we can take to say, I have trusted in Jesus Christ. I'm a new creation in Him. And now I want to share that with everyone else. I want to show everybody through the picture of baptism. But baptism, um, sometimes people think, well, it's kind of this one-time event. But actually, we could look at baptism as just the beginning. It's the beginning of a life of close fellowship with the shepherd. As followers of Jesus Christ, when we get baptized, we publicly identify with the God who saved us, God who did something miraculous, who did something impossible. He took dead people and he brought us to life, just as he did with Jesus Christ. He rose again. The God who did the miraculous through his wonderful power, same power, that rescued us from hell, that saved us from the power and penalty of sin and death, is the same one that we put our trust in. We know that He saved us from ourselves and from a deadened life of self-centeredness and selfishness. And as followers of Jesus Christ, baptism is just the beginning. We constantly look back to the cross. We recognize what God did for us through Jesus Christ. And individually, as a follower of Christ, we look back at our baptism as the point at which we wanted to share with others that we're identifying with Jesus Christ. We're proclaiming that we have trusted in his saving work on the cross on our behalf. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of dying to our old sinful nature, to a self-directed life, and testifying to a new life, a brand new life, being a new creation in him, we have a spiritual nature that's been brought alive through the indwelling Holy Spirit inside each believer in Jesus Christ. So baptism reminds us that we are on a new course in life. We've died to ourselves into the old life and we're now alive in Christ, Romans 6. And our focus is no longer on ourselves, but on our good shepherd, on Jesus Christ, and on others. Okay. So first up... We have Isabel Thorne. All right. So Isabel um, came and, and said that she would like to be baptized. And so um, we, we talked about it with these young ladies, and uh, they were clear about their faith in Christ and understanding what baptism was a picture of, what it is, what it isn't. And they, they said, yes, we, we want to get baptized this Sunday. So I said, okay, <laughs> we, we got it. So Isabel, our, our first question for you is, um, Isabel, have you believed in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with all your heart? Having placed your full faith and trust in him and what he did for you on the cross by personally dying for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. And baptism is a visible demonstration of an inward transformation that's already taken place. It signifies that you are, um, that you have died to sin, and you're a new creation, alive in Jesus Christ. And as Romans 6 says, you have been raised up to walk in a new life. Um, so I'm going to ask you, or I'm going to tell you, um, Isabel, by being baptized here today, you are publicly testifying to your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and testifying to your stated desire to live for him as you follow, learn to follow him as his disciple. One of the things about our God is he is alive, he's personal, he's not dead. We serve a risen Savior, and we serve the God who is the Trinity. He is existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all co-equal and co-eternal. They share all the same divine nature attributes. And so Isabel... Okay, so as our Lord Jesus Christ instructed his disciples, 
It's our joy this morning to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. placing your full faith and trust in him because he personally died for you on the cross. Yes. All right. Um, so, Raquel, I'll, I'll tell you the same thing, that by being baptized here today, you are publicly testifying to your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, testifying to your stated desire to follow him, to walk with him, to learn what that's like, to follow him as his disciple. Are you ready to be baptized? Okay. It's our joy this morning to, to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They came in here wearing dark clothing, representing their old life, and being dead in sin, trespasses and sins, and now having new life in Christ and being alive in here. They're going to come out wearing nice white clothes. So. Let's go. 
that that song is based on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> 